Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T Slim X2 insulin pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, did you ever wish you had a geek squad on call for diabetes tech issues, like one of those big box store helpers? Well, David Panzera with the Helmsley Trust wants to make that happen, starting with CGMs. In an ideal world, the geek squad would write the prescription, would deal with your insurance company, and would have Dexcam, Abbott, etc. send it to your house. From there, we'll teach you how to put it on. And really, after that, it's data interpretation. David shares why he thinks this will work, who will pay for it, and he shares his story. Two of his three children live with type 1. Plus, catching up with Bigfoot Biomedical's Lane Despero, we'll talk about their subscription model and a little bit about timeline. And tell me something good. How's this? Going from DKA to Iron Man in just one year. It's a great story. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. So glad to have you along. If you are new around here, we aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. And boy, did we connect last week. Maura McCarthy, author and speaker, joined me for kind of a Dear Abby for type 1 parents And it was so well received. Thank you so much, everyone who shared that episode and started to chime in on Facebook, because in our Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group, I am asking for more parenting questions. So if you've got a kiddo with type one and you'd like me or Maura to answer your question, I have 12 years of experience. As you know, my son Benny was diagnosed right before he turned two in 2006. And Maura's daughter, Lauren, was diagnosed uh, 21 years ago. So if you'd like to ask us a question, that post is in the Facebook group. And I would love to hear from you. We're going to make that a regular scheduled segment. We're going to do it every month. So go ahead, join the Facebook group if you're not there already, and let us know what you'd like to hear. I'm really looking forward to hearing more of the questions. It's so much fun just to talk to Maura every week. She is one of my inspirations. So uh, it's very nice for me to get to work with her in this capacity. And, you know, the way things have been going with tapings, with taping the podcast and, and putting it out uh, right at the beginning of the new year and with the holidays. I haven't been able to share too much, but we went to Israel over the winter break. Amazing trip. I did share more about that on social media. So if you want to learn more about changing pump insets in the tunnels under the Western Wall in Jerusalem and managing different foods, uh, you know, lots of pita, lots of falafel, uh, interesting different kosher restaurants. We did not check out the kosher McDonald's, and I I regret that. We should have just gone in and got some fries or something. But anyway, if you want to hear more about our trip, head over to the Facebook group or the other social media channels. After the show today, uh, I have shared a lot of our travel story there. Quick note, and I will talk about this a little bit more later, but if you are here specifically for the Bigfoot interview – and I hope you're here for the whole thing, but I know a lot of people are very interested in Bigfoot. I just want to let you know that interview with Lane was conducted in November before the Lily announcement was made. I do have some additional information. I contacted Bigfoot once the news broke and they answered a couple of my questions. So here's what we're going to do later on in the show. We are going to talk about Lily and Bigfoot and I'll give you some more information. And then uh, you'll hear the interview with Lane. That was at the D Data Summit last fall. So I do have a little bit of new information about Lily and Bigfoot, but I still want to be clear The interview, while still having great information and updates from Bigfoot, is not about this latest news. And of course, more on David Penzierer and Helmsley and the CGM Geek Squad in the show notes as well. And we'll get to that interview with David in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. Have you ever tested your blood sugar with a meter and were unsure about the meaning of your result? Take the guesswork out of your numbers with the OneTouch VarioFlex meter. 
It uses color short technology to instantly show you when your or your loved one's blood sugar numbers are low, indicated by blue, in range, green, or high, red, so you can quickly get on with your life. You can also use the meter's built-in Bluetooth smart technology to seamlessly sync with the One Touch Reveal mobile app, available now as a free download for Android devices on Google Play and Apple devices on the App Store. One Touch, because taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. Learn more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Touch logo. My guest this week caught my eye with an article he wrote about a CGM geek squad. The concept here is that a group of diabetes experts could help take the burden off primary care physicians and help people with diabetes, especially those who use insulin. David Panzerer is part of the Helmsley Charitable Trust. He is a trustee. And Helmsley provides grants and support to health initiatives. They have become a huge player in diabetes in the last 10 years. David's two daughters have type 1. We'll talk about that. The Geek Squad idea and another project Helmsley is helping fund, that Tide Pool Loop Partnership we've talked about a lot lately. Here's my interview with David Panzerer. David, thanks so much for spending some time with me. A lot to unpack here, some really exciting news. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, let's start a little bit just by talking about your your family story with type 1. This is very personal for you. You have two daughters with diabetes. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, they were diagnosed a few years apart? Yeah, actually, um, my oldest daughter, Morgan, was diagnosed in 2007 at the age of six. My younger daughter, Caroline, um, was diagnosed last year, um, and she has just turned 15. So I actually have a decade apart. Wow. And it's uh, it's quite different. But for me, when my first daughter was diagnosed, I, I made a very simple promise to her, and I made the same promise to Caroline, and that was that I would help you in any way that I can. And what happened for me is I kind of fell into this because I come from the business world. I didn't know anything about nonprofits. I knew nothing about medical research. But I did, I became a trustee of what's now almost $6 billion trust five months after my first daughter was diagnosed. So it was not such a subtle message as to what I should be doing with my time. And I uh, quit my career in commercial real estate and decided to do this full time. And I've been doing it basically since around June of 2008. And we really spent the better part of 18 months doing diligence before we ever wrote our first grant. Since then, and I've been in the you know the diabetes world or whatever you want to call it since 2006, I've heard about the Helmsley Trust. I, I knew there's a family personal connection. But can you speak a little bit about what that is? I mean, what is the mission of the trust? You fund very interesting things. So we're probably somewhere around 98% focused on health and medical research. You know, the trust mission is to is aspire to improve lives um, by supporting exceptional efforts in the U.S. and around the world in health and select place-based initiatives. The goal of the T1D program, quite simply, is to improve the lives of all people living with diabetes. And I'm not a cure guy. I think cure is a fundraising word. And, you know, I look at this as, um, and by the way, as a society, we've never reversed a chronic disease. So I think the cure word gets thrown around way too often. But we're very focused on two major pieces of uh, in diabetes. And one is to prevent or delay the disease. And we have a very large program overseas, which I'm happy to get into as much detail as you want. Um, and our second um, major focus is to improve outcomes. And I truly believe technology is the way to do so. And I know that we're going to get into that a little later. <laughs> it's a little tough to, to swallow that message. I'm with you on the cure. I'm going to circle back around on that a, a little bit later because it's still a very hopeful message, but I think it can be a tough one to hear. But let's talk a little bit about the big reason why I really wanted to have you on is I read an article or I guess an editorial that you wrote recently. You start off by saying T1D chose me and I chose to kick its ass. So I knew we were going to be in for yeah. a good interview here with someone who speaks his mind. But you talk in that about CGM and about how this is something that you really want to make sure gets to more people. What was the light bulb moment for that? So if you look at the data on CGMs, there is absolutely zero doubt it works, right? You have a lower A1C, you have a reduction in severe events of roughly 40% just by putting on a CGM. And this is data from the T1D exchange. So there's, there's absolutely no doubt that it works. 
And Steve Edelman, who runs TCOID, asked me to give the keynote at his um, conference in San Diego, TCOID 1, I think is what they called it. And so I went, and then after that, the article you read or the op-ed you read was kind of a summary of the talk that I gave at TCOID. So quite simply, I wholeheartedly believe that CGM is it's now ready for prime time, right? Between the Abbott Libre, the Dexcom G6, Medtronic's got a product coming, Sensionics has a product coming. These things are ready for prime time, right? There's no more calibration. There's no more finger sticks. It's kind of a game changer. The form factor is getting better, longer wear, cheaper. And if you asked me, and not only myself, but many, many people who live with this disease, the single most important tool to manage your diabetes is the CGM. And the data 100% supports that. So I guess the question is, what are we trying to do here? Because most people with diabetes do not wear a CGM right now. Yeah. So I think what we have to do is we have a two-prong problem. One is well over 90% of the prescriptions written for CGM are written by the specialty clinic. And quite frankly, if you talk to Dexcom, Medtronic, or Abbott, they only target the specialty clinics. Their salespeople are paid by commission. They have no incentive to target those who live in the primary care world. And the primary care physicians have no incentive to learn about how to titrate insulin dosing. And to be clear, I look at CGM as being a tool that should be used by every single person who's dosing insulin, regardless of whether you're type 1 or type 2. And that's a great Once point. We're talking, insulin, about, right. you on CGM. We're talking about insulin-dependent people with diabetes, not just people with type 1. Correct. So the two-prong problem is, one, I think, is we need a public awareness campaign to increase awareness around CGM and the benefits of CGM. And I believe that campaign should target both the primary care physician and patients directly. And... You know, right now, the primary care physicians are overburdened and they have um, no incentive, as I said earlier, to learn how to prescribe CGM and then learn how to titrate insulin dosing. So we're really looking at a different model, um, which I discussed in the, at the TCOID conference, similar to um, the Geek Squad for Best Buy's Geek Squad. <laughs> so in a nutshell, what, what this entity would do, it would lay out the different options for CGM, this entity would have to be completely CGM agnostic, device agnostic. It's just for the device itself. We would teach you about the different CGMs. In an ideal world, the Geek Squad would write the prescription, would deal with your insurance company, and would have Dexcam, Abbott, et cetera, send it to your house. From there, we'll teach you how to put it on. And really, after that, it's data interpretation. And what do I do with my data? And I think that's probably the biggest gap there's a very significant drop-off in CGM uses within the first 12 months. And some of it's certainly due to cost, but some of it is also due to the fact that people don't understand what to do with the data. And there are algorithms out there available today that are one that's FDA approved and a bunch of others coming that can do this for you. So to me, what I mean by decision support, and you hear these words tossed around all over the place, to me, what decision support is, take all of my diabetes data, and turn it into something actionable for me. And when you look at insulin pumps, they'll have Bluetooth connectivity in them if they don't already, and connected pens are a a year or two away. So let me just stop you there. I have seen the information gap firsthand. I run a very large Facebook group in the Charlotte, North Carolina area for parents of kids with type 1. And almost on a daily basis, someone posts a graph and asks a question that shows that no one taught them how to use the CGM. They don't understand the speed of insulin. They don't understand the drop rate. They don't understand what the arrows mean. They just don't really seem to have had the education. So, I, of course, there's a huge need for something like this. But I'm curious, who's going to pay for that? Right back to David in just a moment. We'll get his answer to that. But first... Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And we've been using the Dexcom G6 since it came out last summer. It is amazing. The G6 is now FDA permitted for no finger sticks for calibration and diabetes treatment decisions. You do that two-hour warm-up and the number just 
pops up. I'm, I'm still getting used to that. It seems like magic to me, I got to tell you. We've been using a Dexcom for five years, and it just keeps getting better. The G6 has longer sensor wear, now 10 days, and the new sensor applicator is so easy to use. Benny does it himself now, and he says, no pain. Of course, we still love the alerts and alarms, and that we can set them how we want. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to David explaining who's going to pay for that CGM Geek Squad. So at the end of the day, both the payers and the CGM manufacturers will pay for this. So long term, and here's kind of the paradigm shift. For the longest time in the United States, we treat symptoms. We don't treat people. And so what payers were really interested in was keeping you out of the hospital and preventing acute events that cost them money. They could care less about your A1C or your long term outcomes because at the end of the day, people, at least in the private insurance world, cycle off your insurance every two and a half to three years. So, you know, you would be somebody else's problem. I think it's a really, really short-sighted view, pun intended, because if you're Aetna's patient and I'm United Healthcare's patient and we're both doing poorly and we cycle through and you end up where I ended up, it makes no sense. But I think the paradigm starting to change, the conversation that I'm having with payers is definitely changing, where payers are now interested in taking care of people long-term. So the real piece of the geek squad that is missing that I think is different than almost all of the other things out there is we really want to take care of people. And if you ask me what's missing, the biggest piece is mental health. And I don't mean coaching because to me, coaching is like a fad diet. You get a little bit of near-term success and then people revert to the mean long-term. I mean truly taking care of people and starting with the mental health because the mental health depression or is a comorbidity in chronic disease almost 40% of the time. And I'm willing to bet you that's very underreported. So I think there's a change happening as we speak where the payers are starting to really think about taking care of patients long term and not just their symptoms which is what's gone on in the past. All right. Well, let me just dial back a little bit in devil's advocate about this, because I think it's a fabulous idea. And as I said, I think the need is great. But we need a geek squad for CGM. Man, we need a genius squad for insulin dosing and for pump use and for, you know, how do I treat my child in the middle of the night when the blood sugar is 350? You know, that, and, and I'm, you know, I'm trying, what does DKA even mean? Do, you know, I, I, we get all sorts of questions in the group that should be going to the endocrinologist and that people can pick up the phone and call their endo. But I'm curious what you would say to someone who says to you, CGM is nice, but look at all these other needs that aren't being met. Yeah, so CGM is the proof of concept for the Geek Squad. Mm. Um, imagine what Geek Squad ultimately ends up being is a virtual specialty clinic. So the way we see this is there'll be an MD, but there'll be an army of certified diabetes educators. And they're going to, as we know, if any of us have been to a diabetes clinic, the CDE does the overwhelmingly large majority of the heavy lifting. So the CDE will be doing most of the lifting and answering all of those questions that you're laying out. Our goal is to take care of people, and we believe CGM offers the best insights into what's happening with your glucose and how different things impact. To your points earlier, the care, even within the endocrinology clinics, for the most part, is mediocre at best, and we need a different model. There's a huge endocrinology shortage in this country, and it's only getting worse. I saw a map recently. I can probably find it and share it with you. It was a map of the United States, and it showed on one page, filled in in blue, how many counties in the U.S. were without a primary care physician. And you can imagine most of it was filled in, meaning they most counties had a PCP. And then the, the second slide showed how many had an endocrinologist. And the large majority of them, especially in rural America, were empty, no access. And that's not getting any better. So we need a different model, and we believe telemedicine and something like the Geek Squad holds the keys to being able to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. All right, so tell us about CGM Champs. This is, I mean, you're not talking about this. You guys are really doing stuff in this next year. Oh, yeah. So we hired a um, PR firm 
about eight months ago, and they were tasked with trying to figure out how do we do a national campaign around CGM awareness. And CGM Champ started because there is no better advocate for CGM than those who are already using it. Um, I don't know if your son uses it, but both of my daughters use CGM, and it's it's a game changer. Five years with uh, Dexcom, um, I should tell you if you don't. It's, we've, it, uh, five years. There you so. go. And, and it's a game changer. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, so we really think that CGM holds the key. So we're going to be doing a national awareness campaign, and I have had conversations, preliminary conversations with Medtronic, Abbott, and Dexcom about taking some of their advertising budget and pooling it and doing an, an awareness campaign where Helmsley would possibly put in some money as well, and we would do a generic CGM awareness campaign to target those who are not using the CGM and make them aware. Because what happened is, if you ask me, and I said this in my talk at um, TCOID, the CGM companies did a really crappy job with making a first impression <laughs> because the first technologies were terrible. Yeah. They hurt. They were inaccurate. They were big. But I'm here to tell you now, they're absolutely ready for prime time. And they're only getting smaller and more accurate and better. And they're much, much more consistent. Do you remember you which know, I, version I, your daughter first used? So, yes, um, the 7, the Dexcom 7. And it, quite frankly, it was terrible. And she wouldn't go back on it for a few years. We went back on it when G5 came out. And uh, I basically blackmailed her as a teenager. <laughs> no, I, no, no. You gave her incentives. <laughs> incentives, we call them. Yes, incentive, <laughs> right. We call that blackmail incentive, same thing. But yes, <laughs> I got her to try a CGM and I told her if you try this for a month, she would get what she wanted and she didn't have to prick her finger 10 or 12 times a day. And I said, you can prick your finger, you can dose off of it, even though it wasn't approved at that time. And after three weeks, she's like, Dad, you think you can get me a couple more of these? And I'm Aww. like, yeah, I can do that. And we haven't looked back since. So she's been on CGM for uh, four or five years now. But that's interesting. So you think that beginning poor impression of some of the CGM, they're playing catch up in some ways now? If you think about it, right, you get one chance to make a first impression. And I would argue that unlike Apple, when you take an Apple out of the box, it's a pretty cool, sleek experience. It's really easy to use. CGM was none of the above. And now, you know, I would say it definitely is there. So, yeah, I think the industry did us a disservice by coming out with a device that people had really high expectations, and I think they were disappointed. And for a lot of folks, that was kind of the end. They're done. They're checked out. And they don't want to hear the latest and greatest technology is back out. But I, I think they we need a way to try and re-engage those who were not up on what's going on in the technology space because CGM is there and it's arrived. So the CGM Champs campaign is one where we're hoping to begin to help spread the word. And you could text the word CGM Champs, so it's C-G-M-C-H-A-M-P-S, all one word, to the number 555-888, and we will keep you in the loop, pun intended again, as to what we're doing as we roll this out. Perfect. And I'll link all of that information up, and there's a website in the show notes uh, at diabetes-connections.com. All right, so you said the word loop. Let's talk about that, because just yeah. recently <laughs> the news came out that the Helmsley Charitable Trust, along with JDRF, is um, collaboratively granting a very large amount of money to Tidepool as they begin developing Tidepool Loop. Now, we've talked about this on the show before. I'll link up the past episodes about Tidepool Loop if you're not familiar. But this is a hybrid closed-loop automated insulin delivery app developed for iOS for Apple. Um, it's a do-it-yourself right now. It is not FDA regulated, but Tidepool has taken responsibility to get it to the FDA and has their first agreement with Insulet, the makers of Omnipod. Other pump companies are expected to follow. And so as you listen, that's what we're talking about here. So tell me, David, you know, why does the Helmsley Trust think this is a great investment? So my daughter has been on Loop for two years. And my daughter is 17 and was in really good control prior to that. But what Loop has done is it's taken the overnight periods that we all fear the most, and it's turned it into our best controlled 10 hours of the day by far. I'm talking literally variations or standard deviations overnight in the teens. 
you know, it's that tight and it's that good once food's gone and you let the algorithm just dial up and down the basal rates. So what happened was Aaron Kowalski and I were talking to Courtney Elias from the FDA back a year and a half ago at the Keystone meeting in Colorado. And we were talking outside and um, we got to talking about, you know, the DIY movement and how I showed Courtney the data on my daughter. And it's really compelling. It became clear to us, and what Aaron always says is we have to take this from kind of below the table and bring it up above the table. And I think he's right, right? So we need to be able to have everybody reap the benefits of how good this algorithm is because it's more sophisticated right now than like the 670G. It does a lot more. It's much more customizable. Once it's up and running, it's easy to use, but there are a bunch of steps to go through it to build it. So what Howard Look and his team are looking to do is to take that algorithm, bring it through the process, and be able to have it be a downloadable app in an app store and eventually Android as well. And the FDA very much wants this to happen, I think, for a number of reasons. And one is it'll give the DIY community a sandbox at which to still innovate in, but it'll be under an FDA-approved app. And the FDA very much wants that to happen because right now it's out there and it's not regulated and it's just not great from an FDA standpoint. I think when you look at ICGM, which is the category around what Dexcom G6 was just approved, it was a brand new category created by the FDA. And in a nutshell, what that means is you hit these kind of certain standards and you can get the ICGM classification, which means you will come through the regulatory pathway much, much faster than if you don't go through that pathway. So now folks are working on iPump, which will also have a very similar outcome, which means the pump will hit certain standards and then you'll have an iPump pathway, which will also be faster to market. Loop has the potential to be the first eye controller or eye algorithm, pick your word, Mm. where you hit certain standards and you will get through the market much faster. So now everybody is chasing iPump And Howard and his team at Tidepool have the potential to be there first for iAlgorithm or iController. And we think that it very much forces everybody back to the table to think more about interoperability. I don't know that you'll ever have a fully plug-and-play where I can plug in with a Medtronic pump and an Abbott sensor and UVA's algorithm and do whatever I want. But I do think it brings uh, a very different conversation to what was going on in the past. And we think patient choice is much, much better. When you say everybody's chasing iPump, what does that mean? You mean uh, companies like Tandem and Insulet and Medtronic and trying to think Diabolu from overseas, the other pump companies, Lily's coming out with a pump. Do you mean those kinds of companies? Yeah, Roche. Okay. Very much so. The FDA has kind of, the way they've set it up, is almost forcing these pump companies down this pathway because they're basically saying if you go down this pathway, you'll have a much easier regulatory pathway that'll be cheaper and faster. If you go a different route, it's going to cost you more money and take you longer. So obviously the companies are going to go for the cheaper and faster route. Here's my dumb question about this. Animus goes out of business a couple of years ago. Other pump and diabetes companies have come and gone. These folks need to make money to stay in the market. How does interoperability help them? I thought the last couple of years the chase was about we're going to have the best algorithm and we're going to partner with the best CGM and you're going to want to buy this system. So my concern, and maybe it's a false one, is if everything is interoperable, that really helps us. I mean, that's fantastic. I would love that. But does it keep these companies in business? Well, I mean, to be determined, but I would think that the interoperability will give patients choice. And we believe patient choice will lead to more adoption. So a good number of folks right now that are using a Medtronic pump and a Dexcom sensor, and yet one doesn't talk to yeah, the other. Good point. Yeah. And for what you know, so this has the potential. And again, it's not going to be as simple as I'm making it sound, but it has the potential for you to pick and choose how you want to go about your components. I think patient choice will help. I think there are other ways that, you know, everybody's looking to layer in other ways to help the patient, which is all good. My own guess is there'll probably down the road be a consolidation in the pump market because I don't know that you're going to have all of these new players to the market survive. But 
competition's good. Competition breeds innovation, and we want that because for the longest time, you know, we had one major, major player in the pump business, and we still do. But there are definitely a lot more competition going on now, and we think that's a good thing. You said at the beginning of this interview you're not a cure guy, and you talked about how there hasn't been a cure for a chronic disease. I assume you mean, you know, for also for an autoimmune disease. That's what I always say when people say, well, why is it so hard? And I always say, well, Correct. there's no autoimmune disease that's, that's been cured. But you talked a little bit about prevention. And I know we're talking about loop and technology and all of that today, but before I let you go, can you speak a little bit? Because I'm concerned that some people may hear this interview and think that the Helmsley Trust is all about you must wear a pump and you must do this and you know you must have the gadgets. But it sounds like there's a lot more going on than that. Can you speak a little bit about the prevention and, and other trials? Sure. So we believe the fact that we're not a public charity and we don't have to fundraise forces us or, or obligates us, I should say, to think differently. And what I mean by that is we should take on the high-risk, long-term projects that the others cannot. And when you look at, as an example, the T1D Exchange, the registry that we helped build, that cost well over $100 million and took more than three years before there was anything useful coming out of it. The public charities could never do that. And the reason why, it's not a knock on them, but the reason why is it takes too long and it costs a ton of money. So we pivoted towards primary prevention because we started looking at things and said, you know what, we really have never reversed a chronic disease. We have prevented a bunch. So why not take a long-term view on trying to prevent type 1 diabetes? And to be clear, we're focused on primary prevention. And what that means is prior to having autoimmunity. So my second daughter, Caroline, had all four antibodies for seven years before she was diagnosed. So what we've done is we've created a platform over in Europe called GPAD, which stands for the Global Platform for Prevention of Autoimmune Diabetes. It's a $54 million project across five countries in Europe. And what we're doing is we are screening the general population, newborns. We are screening 300,000 newborns, and we're going to genetically type all of them. And those who are at genetic risk for type 1, so prior to autoimmunity, we're going to try and intervene with a drug to just see if we can prevent or delay the disease. The reason why this is so incredibly hard and it took almost three years to get going, we're doing it across five countries and we're doing it in babies. So to be able to do this, you know, it, it's a big, big deal. And the beauty of this platform is that we want to be able to show that this platform could be used for many other things you know, other screenings for other diseases, maybe more importantly, intervention trials from industry. And we have a platform now that can recruit upwards of probably 100,000 babies a year. That's a big deal. That gets the attention of industry. That gets the attention, quite frankly, of everybody. And that's what we've built over in Europe. It's a huge project, and it's going to take a few years until we get any sort of indication as to whether we're getting anywhere. But to my knowledge, it's the only one that's doing general population screening across five countries like this. So that's what we're doing in prevention. Before I let you go, um, how are your girls doing? How's your family doing? It sounds like everybody's you know, hanging in there doing okay. Yeah, so my oldest daughter is uh, on pins and needles as she waits to hear about college later this week. <laughs> and uh, she's doing great. She's, you know, Loop has made life so much easier. And as my daughter Morgan would say, she thinks less about her diabetes. But Loop is by no means a fix. You know, you still need to pay attention and be involved. And my daughter Caroline um, is doing well. She's still on a honeymoon now for 15 months. And I would love to get the honeymoon for another 10 years, but I'm not sure that's the lotto <laughs> that I'm going to win. Um, but she's wearing a CGM and does her shot and understands what she has to do. And knock wood, I have a almost 12-year-old son who doesn't have any of the markers but is due to get rescreened because, as we know, these uh, antibodies can come and go. Yeah. So my kids are doing great. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. David, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this. I hope you'll keep us posted. It's terrific to hear more about uh, the Helmsley Charitable Trust and what you're doing. And I can't wait to see more. Thank you. No problem. Um, thanks for having me, and you know where to find me for the future. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims.
lots more information, including the website and number, the text number that David gave out. All of that in the show notes at diabetes-connections.com or wherever you're listening. If you're on a podcast player, they all have the show notes available. Sometimes it says details or more info. But if you have trouble finding it, you can always go back to the website. And for what it's worth, I kind of feel like we have talked about Tide Pool and Loop a ton lately. Sometimes that's just how the news goes. And of course, I did a bunch of interviews at the D-Data conference, and that was the big news there. So yes, Tide Pool did not suddenly become a sponsor of the show. But hey, that's what the community is talking about. So that is one of the things that we are finding ourselves talking about quite a bit. And you know, also at that D-Data Summit, and thanks again very much to the folks at Diabetes Mind for bringing me out to that. I was one of the winners of their Patient Voices Contest, which means that they uh, they paid for my transportation, for my hotel, to bring me to that conference, and I very much appreciate that. It was terrific. And while I was there, I spoke to Lane Despero from Bigfoot, and that is our Community Connection this week. Community Connection brought to you by Tandem Diabetes Care. Lane Desbro has been on the show before, and I will link back to our first interview with him. You may know his son was diagnosed with type 1 at age 10. He is one of the founders of Bigfoot Biomedical. And as you likely heard, they have entered into a new agreement with Lilly Diabetes. As I said at the top of the show, this interview was conducted before that news broke. But briefly, here's what I can tell you about it. I sent some questions to Melissa Lee, the Director of Community Relations for Bigfoot, and in a nutshell, here is what she told me. This is a non-exclusive agreement with Lilly. Bigfoot wanted to make sure that their devices worked well with the insulin pens and insulin that Lilly already makes. Wanted to make sure there was compatibility there. This is not a financial agreement. This is not a investor partnership. This is a partnership of product compatibility. Melissa goes on to say very bluntly, no insulin manufacturer is an investor in Bigfoot Biomedical. They are pursuing other agreements with Novo and Sanofi. Uh, she says they welcome collaboration with all of the insulin manufacturers. The pen systems uh, sounds to me like from what she said, are where the options are going to come more quickly. The pump-based automated insulin delivery system in development in Bigfoot is based on, is, is using the Asante disposable pump body. Asante, no longer in business. Bigfoot bought those assets. And that was designed to house Lily's Humalog pre-filled cartridges. So they are moving to the pivotal trial later this year with that system. And she says they're not going to hold up an FDA submission or commercial launch for multi-insulin compatibility. We don't intend to stop innovating on this front, though. As I'm reading between the lines, it sounds like they are looking to launch with only Humalog in the pump, but that that is not their intent as they move forward. In terms of pricing, which was the big question that everybody had and is the big issue when it comes to insulin, Melissa says that Bigfoot's plan for the auto-fulfilled supply bundle, and you'll hear more about that subscription model in my interview with Lane in just a moment, does not include insulin. So they're going to be a one-stop shop for everything uh, from you know devices, supplies, sensors, but not insulin. And here's what she wrote. Where insulin pricing is concerned, Bigfoot believes people who require insulin should have affordable access, but we are focused on reducing cost burdens for the pieces we can control. So thank you very much to Melissa Lee for giving me a little bit more information about what happened with Bigfoot and Lily. I will link up lots more information, and I'm sure more will come in soon at diabetes-connections.com. I am sure we will follow up and have more on Bigfoot and Lily and how that'll all shake out in a future episode. But here is my interview with Lane. I started out asking if he could explain that subscription model that will make Bigfoot pretty unique. Sure. So I think this was partly inspired by my experience prior to joining Bigfoot, prior to even my son's diagnosis, working in other industries where there'd been a recognition that uh, selling something as a product is an exchange of physical ownership. I own the can of soup, you own the can of soup, and uh, that can of soup may not be very tasty, but if you have somehow marketed it in such a way to compel the uh, person to uh, choose that as they're in the shelf of the supermarket, uh, they're sort of a fool. Sort of fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice. They, they'll come home, have a negative experience with that new ownership of soup and not buy it again. And uh, a service holds you to a much higher 
bar to a much higher uh, commitment to ongoing delivery of value to the customer. And so this is kind of like a restaurant <laughs> is a service experience. It might be the exact same soup that you're, you're getting, but restaurants won't be open for very long if they're not providing a consistent, tasty experience. And so from my experience at uh, Honeywell and GE, where they had been working on this in an industrial context, like uh, Honeywell stopped selling aircraft braking systems and started selling landings to their customers. Uh, how many landings would you like to buy? Wow. And we are the experts in aircraft braking systems. We know how to manage them, how to maintain them. You don't have to develop a competency in the brakes. So it, it transcends from a something about a product to an experience. And uh, then you can get even more committed to the benefit by putting your own skin in the game, saying we are so committed to this shared success that we have together as uh, co-owners of, of a service that uh, we are prepared to put some of it at risk, uh, that uh, if we're not fulfilling our uh, expectations that you have on us, then uh, we won't get paid as much. So it, it allows us to uh, really reinforce the commitment we have to the value that we believe uh, what we're doing will bring to our users, our stakeholders. So it's not just the person with diabetes, it's their provider, it's their payer, uh, and all of them have important roles to play and, and decisions to make in the ongoing management of diabetes. You know, it, as I listen, I expected your answer to be from the customer point of view, not so much from your accountability. What is the good thing about a subscription for the customer then? I assume and I'll, I'll answer it for myself, but then you tell me if I'm right or wrong. But part of it is with most pump companies, we have this thing for four years. And we pay up front or we don't or our insurance denies us or it doesn't. Is that part of the equation here? Uh, I think part of this were, uh, yes, some of the anecdotes I've heard and, and even seen myself as an early adopter of technology and every shiny object I want to <laughs> evaluate, that so many of these things don't satisfy their original promise and they wind up in a drawer. So you know, somebody battles with their uh, insurance provider and their doctor writes the letters of medical necessity and they finally get this shiny $10,000 durable medical equipment warranted thing and it beeps and buzzes and drives them crazy and a month later it's sitting in a drawer. So that's a huge loss uh, for them, for their insurance provider who paid it and ultimately the company because they didn't produce any value. So, again, this really reinforces our commitment and belief in the value that we're creating. We don't want our stuff sitting in a drawer. And it won't sit in a drawer if it's a service. It'll go back. And then – so it's about creating uh, an alignment of incentives uh, that we want our users to be as successful uh, as they can with our therapy. And it holds us accountable. The other dimension to this is – and remote monitoring and, and bringing things back to the cloud is a key enabler of a service-led business. So, for instance, when I was at GE, we were doing the same thing that we're talking about at Bigfoot, but for gas turbine power plants, where we were selling power by the hour and monitoring the asset, whether it was in Saudi Arabia or South America. And uh, because we had data flowing to both the vendor and to the end user, we had the same picture of what value was being created or not created. And by uh, having access to that uh, data, we could commit to uh, shared benefits. And then there's other great things that happen with this data, such as it helps to inform new product development and come up with next generation products much faster. So uh, this notion of being uh, deeply connected through a service engagement to our uh, customers and users confer many benefits. I'll put you on the spot and no comment is a fair comment here. Are there plans with, within Bigfoot to do things uh, like uh, more a la carte? In other words, I can work with this CGM, I could work with this software, I could work with this company. Can you talk a little bit about components? I'm not quite even sure what to call them. Sure. So I think what you're asking, Stacy, is more around it's a journey, not a destination. And interoperability has, has been a major benefit of other industries which predate us. So the, the ones that I come from for uh, industrial automation, we've been interoperable for 25 years. So that is predominantly a cost play. <laughs> that once something is sort of good enough, then you standardize it and then you can interoperate. So I was uh, 
uh, I use the metaphor of, of screws. Once you converge on how many threads per inch and diameters of screws, then innovation stops at the screw level and it goes up a level to machines. What machines can we build from those screws? So that sort of commoditizes the screws. <laughs> and so vendors are generally reluctant to do this, right? If you're a screw maker, it's like, look, I've got a fancy screw. I, I should, I should get more money for my screw. And, right. and fortunately or unfortunately, many of these base technologies like CGM and yeah. insulin pumps are now sort of at that yeah. screw level that they are all good enough. They are serving the needs. They're accurate enough. And now we're going to see innovation one level up at the machine level at the automated insulin delivery wow. system. I guess, so to make it more specific, and I'll put you on the spot, we use currently um, a Tandem T-Slim X2 with a Dexcom CGM. I would love to be able to say to my son, well, if you get tired of the Dexcom, you can slap on a Libre and use it with the T-Slim. Or if you get tired of the T-Slim, you can slap on this Bigfoot pump and use the Dexcom. If you have skin irritation, this doesn't work, you can try that. If this doesn't work, are we ever going to see that happen, you think? I think that we will ultimately see that happen, but there are other factors at play. Interoperability, I would assert, is is neither necessary nor sufficient for safety and effectiveness and scalability. So there were times in my domain of the past where there wasn't interoperability. Everything was made by one vendor. It was a vertical technical stack, and the job was getting done. The refineries were being controlled in a safe and effective way. Then interoperability came along, and it actually introduced a whole bunch of new challenges mm. that needed to be resolved. So it's almost like we're going to go over a hump on our way to the nirvana on the other side of interoperability. These are things like, how do you ensure that a system that's built from interoperable components is behaving in the way that it needs to behave from a safety and effectiveness yeah. perspective? So I'm not describing this very well, but put it another way, we have very few people at Bigfoot thinking about interoperability, and we have almost 100 employees now thinking about other things beyond interoperability. So the question is, what are we doing that we believe is so necessary for safety and effectiveness and commercial viability that is consuming the, you know, 100 people's time that may or may not be taking place in the interoperability space? It's a very good point because really what I'd like to say to my son is, here's your thing. Don't worry about diabetes as much. Whatever yes. that thing is. Absolutely. So we got carried away a little bit with interoperability, but that's the ultimate goal. Yes. Well, you, I think we pattern or liken or aspire more towards an Apple model where Apple thinks very deeply about the devices and the app store and the interplay between these things. They're looking at the experience that they provide and not to be uh, pejorative, but Android is a different thing, right? You have much more flexibility. You can plug and play. You get all of those different choices, but sometimes choice and happiness aren't correlated. The more choice you get, the more paralyzed you can be and buyer's remorse. So we're really trying to consider the, the, the customer's journey, the, the user's journey in this and, and make it simple. We don't want, when I was at Medtronic, there was a, a time where we brought in some industrial designers and they were talking about, well, how do you make your app more sticky? How do you make that more engaged that, that people are going to want to open your app? And I said, you're asking exactly the wrong question. We want diabetes to fade into the background. Our app is successful if it is not front and center, if it, it allows people to get on with the things they actually want to do. Because no Nobody signed up for diabetes. Yeah, that's a great point. A great point. You mentioned earlier that, you know, 100 people at Bigfoot all working on other these, things. Other <laughs> things other than, um, can you share a little bit about not just the, um, the pump, which I think many people are, are familiar with, but this is more than uh, insulin pump delivery, right? You have pens mm -hmm. that you're working on. What's different about the Bigfoot pen system, if you could share? I think uh, at a high level or a simplified way of looking at it, we believe that the algorithms for titration and individualization that we've developed or these closed-loop algorithms still work. They're just going to work slower because unlike an automated insulin delivery system where you have the potential to adjust basal rates every five minutes or 15 minutes, which is 288 or 96 times a day, you're going to be actuating or making a move three or four times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, bedtime. So there's not as rapid a feedback loop in terms of learning and adjusting the uh, as people's uh, needs for insulin change over time or by behavior or, or uh, physiology. So uh, at a high level, we believe that there are 
A similar advantage is conferred. You won't achieve all of the benefits that you will in closed loop because you don't have as many times to uh, interact and sort of adjust uh, the glucose based on insulin adjustment. But the main reason for doing it is that 70% of people here are still on multiple daily injection. And we want to meet people where they're at. And uh, by having this solution, we can meet a bunch of people where they're at and maybe, well, we believe help them achieve much better outcomes than they have today and reduce their cognitive burden, their emotional burden, and then provide a stepping stone, a, a light, a nice path if they want to achieve even better results, even higher time and range. So we're coming up on a time where it seems like Bigfoot will be going through the clinical trials, the pivotal trials, all of the things you need to do to really come to market, hopefully in just a couple of years, pretty soon now. You know, you all started this, you're all diabetes dads getting together to try to bring this algorithm to market. Is it still exciting for you? Are you still as optimistic as you were when you started? Have they beaten it out of you guys yet? <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long slog. I've been in the diabetes world now for nine years, and to continue to bring a level of passion and engagement, it, it takes a lot of energy. And uh, there are ups and downs, but I think part of it for me is that where we are with respect to completion of the technical development and now we're into uh, a clinical trial phase where basically all of the engineering work is done and I'm an engineer so it's almost like at the end of term uh, like what do you <laughs> feel at the end of term after the finals are done right. and then what do you do next uh, with that so I, uh, I've i worked very hard over the last couple of years to build a, a set of algorithms and uh, a set of capabilities to characterize those algorithms that it gives me huge confidence in what those algorithms are going to be able to achieve when they're instantiated in these systems. And now I just get to sit back and watch the, the baby that our team has created go through what I believe are not going to be particularly informative or surprising pivotal trial. I, I believe it'll be a confirmatory trial, not an exploratory trial. Sure, sure. We, we will learn some things, but we will, uh, I believe, if our original uh, clinical research center trial two and a half years ago was any, any indication, it's just going to confirm what we knew before through some of the simulation work that we had done. I don't know if you can answer this, but I'll ask it anyway. Brian Maslish, who created the original algorithm, had his son and his wife using it. Do you know if they still are and oh, how they, they are doing? They are, and they're doing fantastically well. <laughs> That's great. Lane, thank you so much for talking with me. My pleasure. Anytime. More on Bigfoot in the links. Lots of information with them. And it seems like every couple of weeks, there is something new here. In a couple of years, man, it sounds like we're going to have so many options. Very exciting stuff. <laughs> Tell me something good this week from DKA to Iron Man. This young woman has a terrific story, and Tell Me Something Good is brought to you by Real Good Foods. Now, we love to try new things around here. Benny is always up for a taste test. Been that way since he was a toddler. So when we saw Real Good Foods doing a lot of great stuff during Diabetes Awareness Month in November, I knew we had to try it. Benny started with the Supreme Pizza. It's sort of a personal size pan pizza with tons of yummy toppings. I told him to please save me a bite, whether he liked it or not. Well, he liked it so much, he forgot to save me a bite. Since then, we've tried many of their products, uh, the pizza, the poppers, and he loves that the pizza is eight carbs. I like that too. I also love that it's easy to find. It's right in my grocery store freezer section. And yeah, you can definitely order online for more variety. Check it out at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. I know we're only a couple of weeks into the new year and this new segment, but I I love this. I am so excited to get your good news stories and to share them here. And when Lauren Dolan wrote this, and this was in the Facebook group, and that's where I'm going to be collecting these stories, I knew I had to share it with you. And then the story got better. All right, so Lauren wrote, I did my first Ironman, and if you don't know what Ironman is, this is a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, and then a marathon, 26.2 miles running. Oh, my gosh. So she did her first Ironman. She says, it's something I would never have done if I hadn't been diagnosed with T1D and met so many amazing, inspiring T1D athletes. Great story already, but I asked her to share a little bit more. Like, you know, what athletes was she talking about? And she shared that. But before I get to that part of the story, 
listen to this. So Lauren is a PhD student right now. So she's already kind of busy, right? And it was just last year that she was diagnosed in DKA. So we're talking April of 2017. She's five days in intensive care and diagnosed with type 1. There's a great article about her that I will link up. And she says in it that after her diagnosis, she was afraid she would be limited for the rest of her life. And so she took the first step to what she says, believing I could conquer anything. And that first step wasn't like walking down the block or, you know, resuming my fitness routine. It was running the Disney Marathon for JDRF. Amazing. She joined the Type 1 Diabetes Athletes Group, a really great Facebook group. And then she joined Riding on Insulin. And that is really where the Iron Man part comes in. We've talked to the Riding on Insulin folks. They are incredible. And she said she joined a local cycling group that really embraced her. They're a group of mostly older women, many of whom are Iron Man athletes themselves who acted like my bike moms. Epilogue, Lauren writes, I am doing an Ironman and many more triathlons in 2019, and I just got an Ironman coach who also has T1D. This is Cliff Sherb. You may know him. He went to the Ironman World Championship. I feel so hopeful, Lauren says, for my future in the sport and T1D management. Tell me something good. Tell me something incredible. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing your story. Again, I will link up the article about her and more information about riding on insulin, you know, if you're interested in training for an Ironman at diabetes-connections.com. Share your good news with me, please. The easiest way to do it is pop in the Facebook group where I, I'll solicit this about once a month. You'll see the post. You can always email me, stacy at diabetes-connections.com. You don't have to complete an Ironman to be featured in good news. <laughs> like me, you can just go to the gym a couple of times a week. Or maybe, as we heard last week, a young child goes back to school. Or, you know, you change an inset for the first time. Or your local town has an event for diabetes. Let me know. If it's good news, I want to share it. And as I said, this is really becoming my favorite part of the show. Really appreciate hearing your stories. As you're listening to this week's show, the JDRF Summit here in Charlotte is just past, as I'm taping it, just a couple of days away. I'll give you a full report on that next week, but I'm really looking forward to meeting some new people and seeing some old friends, kind of kicking off the speaking and going to conferences right in my backyard, which is a fantastic way to start. I would love to come and speak at your event. The schedule is filling up, but there's some slots left. If you have a JDRF summit or uh, any kind of diabetes conference in your area, please let me know. I'd love to come and share the podcast with you or do one of the many presentations that I do, just email me stacy at diabetes-connections.com and we'll get that done. Hey, do me a favor, share the show. If you like the podcast, if you like what you're hearing, you know, share it with a friend who's touched by type one or you know, share it on social media, email it to somebody. The best way to get the word out is really by your word of mouth. And next week we are going to be talking to Dexcom's CEO, I will be asking him about the New Year's Eve outage and many other issues. Lots of good stuff coming up with Dexcom. But, you know, yeah, that was important. I think it's uh, it's a good idea to ask any and all questions. So please tune in for that. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanis from Audio Editing Solutions. And thank you for listening. I appreciate you very much. We've made some changes to the show in the new year. Please let me know what you think and what else you'd like to hear more of or less of. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.